So we're going to finish off today by talking about uh, bleeding and management uh, in postoperatively in the cardiac surgical patient. It's something that we do in every day, it's something that requires a lot of our time, source utilization, and um, has been the focus of a lot of my interest for many years. We talked about my disclosures. So the term hemostasis basically is basically means stop, stopping bleeding. And the body has an incredible number of physiologic and pathologic mechanisms by which it helps regulate this important process. One of the important things is that there are three major components to hemostasis, the blood vessels, the coag proteins, um, and platelets. And all three interact in a very complex and dynamic fashion. We've all stayed in the operating room or taken patients back for bleeding for a defect in any one of, of these three um, issues. Just so you know, if you have very tight vasculature, you can have a complex set of coagulopathy and not bleed. So there is a bit of complexity, but bleeding is, a, again, part of what we do and how we manage every day. The blood as it circulates in the vasculature is highly regulated, especially the vascular endothelial surface. After extracorporeal circulation, major traumatic injury, uh, massive transfusion coagulopathy, the perturbations that occur are very complex, but especially after extracorporeal circulation. Furthermore, our patients with cardiovascular disease are on a multitude of agents that inhibit either thrombin, platelets, or both. Atrial fib, coronary disease, stents, and all these things greatly influence also bleeding and coagulation. But what I really want to talk about is some of the general principles in my now 18 minutes uh, to go over this very complex area. All that intrinsic, extrinsic gobbledygook you learned years ago is uh, probably not terribly relevant because coagulation is a whole series of complex interaction steps, and it's an inflammatory response. In sepsis, I like to refer to it as thromboinflammation, but the complexity of all things that happen are far more complex than intrinsic, extrinsic activation. But the important point, I think, in particular, is the fact that damage the blood vessel, express what's under the subendothelial vascular basement membrane is a particular protein called tissue factor, which activates thrombin. Thrombin is a major signaler, and then amplifies with the interaction of platelets and coagulation proteins. So what we're really going to talk about uh, in the next 17 minutes is the treatment of coagulopathy, two major perspectives, both blood products and prohemostatic agents. I'm really going to focus on the prohemostatic agents and therapeutic approaches as well as some guidance and, and algorithms. But uh, Jamie earlier talked about the New England Journal of Medicine article David Mazur did out of Canada where he looked at a hemoglobin of 7.5 um, intra-op versus 9.5 post-op compared to 8.5. I mean, this thing got in the New England Journal of Medicine. The red cell story is low-hanging fruit. Everybody focuses on red cells where we really can make progress is in reducing the allogeneic components of platelets, plasma cryoprecipitate, and a multiplicity of sticky stuff that to me is really important, and that's kind of been my focus. Just a few comments about blood products. Um, every time you give a blood product, um, you're giving an, uh, basically a donor of uh, cellular components. We type blood to ABO compatibility, there's a multitude of cellular uh, antigens from HLA, leukocyte, platelet-specific, um, and a variety of other things that can produce a whole series of inflammatory reactions, including trally. Although the reduction of blood using only male-specific donor has been very important in the whole story of reducing trally. But even though blood is leuco-reduced, it's not leuco-zero, and as a result, something to think about is that reducing blood the red cell story is, I think, over overemphasized. Where we really need to do is focus on looking at different therapeutic strategies, and there are other things that there's a lot of data out there. One of the things used probably inappropriately in, in all surgical patients in a surgical setting is the use of plasma. The only 
data that really supports plasma efficacy to me is in traumatic injury, um, and that's a whole separate issue. But other than that, plasma is, has very little efficacy. We did a recent meta-analysis that was published on that, and there's just a paucity of data that suggests plasma does anything. Anyhow, the important point is that focusing on other therapeutic strategies are important. There is an extensive amount of literature out there that looks at transfusions are associated with adverse outcomes. Um, from uh, even years back, we reported on especially focusing on platelets, but there's a lot of data that really supports um, the adverse effects of blood. The problem is that if you look at some of these large analyses, they say, well, obviously transfusions are associated with worse outcome, but the patients who are the re-ops, the patients on antiplatelet agents, the sicker, more problematic emergency medicine patients are patients who bleed more, transfuse more. So it's, you gotta really carefully interpret this data. Where I really wanna do is focus on a lot of the work that I've done and others as well as the pro-hemostatic pharmacologic therapeutic approaches as well as putting it all together in a, in a management strategy. First thing, protamine. We talked a little about that this morning. I think it's really critical avoiding excess protamine. We and others have shown that protamine inhibits a series of um, the coagulation proteins, carboxypeptidases, and a whole variety of other important proteins. Um, excess protamine can contribute to bleeding, and unfortunately, I think clinicians give far, far too much protamine. If you use heparin protamine titrations, the best benefit of that test is it tells the exact amount of protamine to reverse at the end, one of the things is that protamine is really one of the goofiest molecules we give. It comes from salmon sperm. It's a histone. It's about 70% arginine. And there's a whole series of adverse reactions from anaphylaxis to other problems. Just to want to take you over through this is a, a kind of, I was always taught that excess protamine was bad, but we've actually, and others have shown that. The important point is that the lowest ACT you get when you give protamine is at the exact stoichiometric reversal, which usually is a lot less than what you have to administer. Half-life of heparin's an hour. A good rule of thumb for reversal is like if you've given 30,000 of heparin's for cannulation, start with 150 milligrams of protamine, half of that initial dose, and then additional 25 milligram uh, additional um, administration dosing. Because what happens is when you get to two to three times the excess, you start to prolong your ACT, you give more protamine, and you get into a vicious cycle. George Despotis had a very cool study showing about 20 years ago in JTCS, higher heparin, maintaining that two to three level we talked about earlier of units per mil, and reversing with the exact amount of protamine, patients bled less. Let's go on to another extensively used agent that really doesn't do much, and that's desmopressin, DDAVP. DDAVP is the V2 analog, remember, of arginine vasopressin. Why does it reduce bleeding? Well, what the V2 analog does, it releases von Willebrand factor from the uh, Weibel Pilates in the vascular endothelium, Weibel Pilates bodies in the vascular endothelium, these crystalline dense structures. If you're giving vasopressin, you're giving V1, VO2 effects, and the stress response of surgery alone increases your arginine vasopressin unless you're vasoplegic. The important point is that most of the studies, and if you look at the totality of this data, um, whenever DDAVP is used, it's used with a variety of other things, blood products. I think it's not unreasonable to give it because it allows you to play delay of game where everything may kick in and patients, by the time you close the chest, go to the ICU, they stop bleeding. Um, actually, when you release von Willebrand factor, you're also stimulating tissue plasminogen activator, TPA release from the vascular endothelium. So you may be also in increasing fibrinolysis, which clearly is one of the causes of bleeding. And that takes us into 2018 management of bleeding. And one of the things in cardiac surgery where the multitude of data, it's in orthopedics and some other scenarios, as well as in traumatic injury, is the use of antifibrinolytic agents. Most of the world uses tranexamic acid. Only in North America do we use epsilon aminocaproic acid. 
These are drugs that look a lot like lysine. Plasminogen recognizes a lysine residue in protein by Brinogen receptor proteins and binds to it and causes plasmin activation. By giving an agent that basically inhibits fibrinolysis, it's an arginine analog. Um, I'm sorry, it's a lysine analog, and it's basically a decarboxylated lysine. Just important to remember when we talk about antifibrinolytics that there's a lot of small studies. It's in recent years, we've had the NEJM study out of Australia that showed efficacy and safety. Most all of the data is tranexamic acid and not amicar. The amicar data is really weak, and we even have shown where amicar probably may not reduce allogeneic blood. The doses of tranexamic acid reported in cardiac surgery range from 2 to 25 grams. The um, Canadians use about 6 to 8 grams. CRASH-2 uses about 2 grams. And it's the 6 to 8 gram dosing where you start to see seizures. Most of the studies that have looked at it compared to a protein years ago looked at lower risk, but now tranexamic acid and amicar are the standards of therapy. I think one of the important things is to remember amicar has been removed from a lot of European markets. And if anybody ever questions the safety of tranexamic acid, not sure if you all realize, but tranexamic acid is licensed for excessive menstrual bleeding under the trade name of Lysteta at a dose of 4 grams a day, 1.3 grams POTID, with no seizures, no issues, um, and a very interesting safety record. One of the critical things that I think in all cardiac surgical patients that needs to be done is to modulate plasma. This is an editorial I wrote for CRASH-2 in Lancet. How many of you know about CRASH-2, the trauma study of use of a gram load? Raise your hand. Um, anyhow, it's for those of you who don't do trauma or haven't done trauma, it's a very interesting study out of the UK, run out of the London School of Hygiene, Patients uh, worldwide get a gram load and a gram over eight hours, and a reduction of bleeding only slightly, but an improvement in mortality. One of the interesting things is that plasmin, or fibrinolysis, remember that fibrinolysis is the generation of plasmin from plasminogen. Plasmin not only cleaves receptors, it cleaves proteins and makes proteins not work and cleaves clot, but it has a whole series of other pro-inflammatory effects from lysing receptors on platelets so platelets don't work, creating fibrinogen degradation products that kind of look like haptin inhibition and prevent cross-linking in platelets. It also does a lot of pro-inflammatory effects, activates complement through C1 esterase. So shutting off plasma is really important. What's really neat about cardiac surgical patients is you can prophylax for the inflammatory injury. In other words, before you make the incision, you start the tranexamic acid or antifibrinolytic load, then you start the infusion, and I run it postoperatively as well. When the patient comes to me in the intensive care unit, my three questions are, what's your fibrinogen level? What's, um, is the patient on an antifibrinolytic? Um, and what's your platelet count? Important three perspectives. So one of the only downsides to me of tranexamic acid is a story of seizures. There's a lot of interesting literature about that. The 6 to 8 gram dose is probably the threshold. And then with deep hypothermic circulatory arrest, you do seem to get it in the CSF. We've shown that. Um, but there probably needs to be an underlying additional substrate that it produces the seizures. Why does tranexamic acid produce seizures? Well, tranexamic acid actually looks a lot like this molecule on top called gamma immunobutyric acid. It's what you're brain secretes, the neurosystem neuro secretes, like benzos, diazepines, to sort of produce neurorelaxation. It's two carbons short, but in the cyclic structure of tranexamic acid as shown here, basically it's probably that cyclic chair structure that makes it look very much like gamma aminobutyric acid. And mechanistically through that, through glycine metabolism and other things may be important. The other important thing to think about in your patients who bleed is you want to know what the fibrinogen level is. How many of you in the room, when a patient's bleeding, send a fibrinogen level or do a, some sort of level? Raise your hand. Bravo. Good for you guys. Excellent. Um, fibrinogen is a critical component. 
component. As I mentioned earlier, it circulates at the highest concentration of all your circulating proteins, seven to eight micromolar. And remember that the ammunition of clock is platelet fibrinogen interaction. So what's the platelet count? What's the fibrinogen? And are you on an antifibrinolytic to prevent the breakdown of the clot and all the nasty stuff that happens? Platelets and platelet receptors basically are where the activation of platelets occur due to a variety of stimuli, expressing the 2B3A receptor where fibrinogen bind crosslinks and creates your clot structure. The problem is that in 2018, we still don't have great platelet function tests for Pope's operative management. The TEG and the Rotem really is not a great platelet test, but it does look very much at fibrinogen levels. The bottom line is one of the things we need is better testing for platelets, and we and others are working on that. But fibrinogen not only is important as generating your clot, but it also has other important interactions with red cells with factor 13 that creates a good clot that's the resistant to lysis and breakdown. So just as a reminder, measure the fibrinogen level. Normal levels are about 200 to 400 milligrams per deciliter. When you give fibrinogen in the form of concentrates like they do in Europe and the US with cryoprecipitate, you normalize the maximal amplitude or maximal clot firmness of TEG and Rotem. Um, in the US, we use cryoprecipitate. Uh, it's a multi-donor product. In Europe, it's removed from a lot of the big countries except the United Kingdom. Is it better than fibrinogen? Um, there's a study going on in Canada, actually, a big cardiac surgical study called the Fiber Study, comparing fibrinogen to cryo. Cryo is a really interesting product. The other name for cryo is called anti-hemophilic factor because it contains a lot of factor VIII. But five, five, uh, cryo contains fibrinogen. It contains von Willebrand factor, what makes platelets stick, kind of a tasty treat, if you will. It contains factor 13. Lots of microparticles that may be very procoagulant. And it's kind of like shooting skeet. You use a shotgun and not a 308, 30-06, six or a single bullet. So the point is that it's a blast of interesting procoagulant stuff that cryo is really important. Blood bankers are reluctant to give cryo if they're not bought into the concept of the importance of normalizing fibrinogen. Cryo contains a lot of interesting things, as I mentioned. When you give cryo, usually five to 10 units, you're giving about two grams of fibrinogen, which is what you give when you give fibrinogen concentrates. Um, Tim Goodenow, who runs the blood bank at Stanford, and I published in the American Society of Hematology um, our review on how I use fibrinogen in acquired bleeding, and it's basically an algorithm that's sort of modified in managing bleeding. Remember, the patient's bleeding now in the intensive care unit. You certainly want to do all the important things like any trauma patient, normothermia, normal pH. If you haven't get an antifibrinolytic, you should load with a gram of tranexamic acid and a gram infusion over eight hours, like CRASH-2, and send your coagulation test. I think a prothrombin time is critical. The PTT tells you about heparin. You want to do a fibrinogen level, platelet count. Then, if you have a TEG or a Rotem, I think it's really important to send it. If you send a Rotem and you have a Rotem, I send a tissue factor activated Rotem called an XTEM because tissue factor is the sort of pathologic mechanism by which clots, or physiologic, which clot forms. Very important. Taking this together in um, a JTCS uh, sort of commentary we wrote some years back, which is similar, send a tag and a Rotem, check your fibrinogen. If the PTT is elevated, this is where giving a little additional protamine may be important. One thing um, that may be very helpful is to run a protamine infusion, take 50 milligrams and give it over a two to three hour period because heparin rebound occurs at about two to three hours. Remember, you reverse heparin with protamine, it's just a nonspecific acid-based polycationic, polyanionic interaction. And these precipitates resolubilize. At, a, at about two to three hours. So a protamine infusion is certainly reasonable. If the patient's bleeding and you need to do some empiric therapy, if your XTEM and ROTEM are totally normal and you're bleeding a lot, it's a great 
consideration that you've got a hole. But if you're oozing and you're not sure, tegrotum's reasonable, then I think that's your kind of stuck with empiric platelet administration. The DDAVP story is, is still questionable, and if you're on vasopressin, do you really need DDAVP? One thing that clinicians forget to do is treat the anemia. And there's growing data about the role of the red cell in clot formation. One of the people across town where I live at UNC has shown very cool how the red cell membrane interacts with factor 13. It's also in the microcirculation. It's thought that the red cells will displace platelets to the micro, to the periphery of the microcirculation and may be important in the, in the microhemostatic bleeding and process. Don't forget your antifibrinolytics. And if you have massive bleeding, clearly a massive transfusion protocol, and any algorithm will be helpful. Just to show you the critical nature of a multimodal consideration, if you have coagulopathy, and this is where we've kind of created a coagulopathic model with TPA. This is a, a, a XTEM, takes a while to clot, you clot, and then you lyse. If you give an activator like 7A or PCCs, you get better onset. Fibrinogen. The only way to totally correct this is with substrate like fibrinogen, antifibrinolytic like a protein, and a procoagulant, off-label 7A or like prothrombin complex concentrates. Of the PCCs, um, the one that we use is, is a three-component PCC that has lower amounts of factor 7. Um, there has been a lot of controversy about factor 7. We looked at it extensively over the years, but if there is one indication where seven tends to work, there's interesting efficacy uh, about the use of seven once you've repleted all your factors, again, off-label, but an interesting perspective. And what we've done is followed Tim Goodenow's recommendations when I was at Emory, as well as part of our algorithm at Duke. If you have significant hemorrhage and you've repleted all your other factors, your ACT is reasonably normal and you still have bleeding, then using one to two milligrams off-label of recombinant 7A may be important. And there's Ravi Gill's study in circulation, I think 2019, that supports this off-label application. So in summary, bleeding's complex. Patients bleed to multiple issues. Anticoagulants are ubiquitous in all of our patients. The other, that's a whole separate discussion. Allogeneic blood, uh, poses risk, and I think pharmacologic strategies are important. Clearly, antifibrinolytic therapy is important, um, and therapy should be multimodal. Remember, all pro-hemostatic agents have risk, but bleeding does too. Language is kind of my hobby. Um, for those of you who have some linguistic perspective and interest, the, the kanji character for blood is this. Um, uh, crap. The kanji character for blood is this, which is the sacrifice at the altar and all the bleeding. I think it looks a lot like a pleurivac, frankly. <laughs> How art imitates life. And the age-old philosophical question, is your pleurivac half full or half empty? Thank you very much. <laughs>